well. How's everybody doing? Great. Great. Awesome, right? Want another day? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. right? Who doesn't? Uh, so for those of you who weren't here just a minute ago, this is my second presentation of the day and of the, the summit and the last of the summit. <laughs> Uh, but uh, my name is Kirk Freinheit. I work for Symantec, and I developed the Gun CLI uh, PowerShell module to let you automate backup exact. And I work with a couple of other smart guys. We have a lot of fun. We have the most fun probably of anybody on the team is anybody here with guests. Yes. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is module design rules and like the bend them, right? So this is not a code-heavy talk. There are, there are a lot of code snips in here. It's really about how to think and the decisions to make when you're when you're making a module. But in order to do that, we have to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the module, uh, naming things, how commandlets and parameters work, object types, and then some binary module tips because most of what I do is write a binary module. Uh, the vast majority of what I do actually is in binary. Is anybody else writing binary modules in the room? Anybody writing script modules on a regular basis? Anybody never written a module in their life? All right, very good. Good to know. And at the end, if there's time, time for questions. So what exactly is a PowerShell module anyway? Uh, it's nothing more than a package of functionality that integrates with PowerShell. And it exposes commandlets, has output types, and if you're doing it right, it's got documentation. And you better be doing it right. Um, and you can write them in script, in binary, or a combination of the two. It's very flexible in how you, how you build them. So it's quick anatomy. We've got a directory that, that contains your module, and the name of your module is the name of that directory. And we've got this manifest file, module name.psd1. That is a metadata file that talks about what's inside the module and a few other things about it. The psm1 file is its root module script, and also the same name, the module's name.psm1. Then you get a bunch of DLLs, one or more, zero or more really, um, any number of auxiliary scripts. You get your format files, your types and, and format PS1 XML files to hook in with the formatting output subsystem. And then any other resources that you might, might be delivering. Uh, like in my case, we localize our help in 13 different languages, so all those files are also part of my module directory. So the rule, the first rule is package everything in a folder. You don't technically have to. You can just ship a PSM1 file, but don't. <laughs> all right. Because the thing is that you've got this PS module path where all of your modules are loaded from. Your users can import module fully qualified path, but whoever wants to do that, you want to import module MCLI or my awesome module. And if you're going to give it just the short name, that name needs to be something that PowerShell can find in a PS module path. So that's an environment variable, just like path, except it's made for where your PowerShell modules live. And if everybody plays nice and just puts in the directories, when you look in that, in that PS module path you made for yourself, it's just a nice pretty list of directories, not a list of directories and PSM1 files and other junk. So just keep it clean, because also your code tends to grow if you're lucky or unlucky, depending on how you look at that, right? So you might be adding more and more um, files and features to your module, and if you ship this just one file, you're kind of stuck with being a script file. It's just called module name of PSM1. And then everybody gets their own sandbox to play. My role is provide a manifest. You don't technically have to, but you really, really should, because um, it contains metadata about, about your module. And uh, those PSD1 files are safe because they only allow a limited subset of the language. You can't execute code in them. It's literally just a file full of metadata about your module. And the command let new module manifest is your friend to build those. It asks all the right questions, has uh, all the right uh, <coughs> mandatory parameters, so you have to give certain information, that sort of thing. But the minimum benefit you get from this, and something that I've run into with uh, our latest version is, uh, our version of our product is versioning of both your code so you have your own module version, and you can specify the version of PowerShell that you require for your module. And this time around, we're actually shipping two versions of our module. It's the same code, but built for .NET uh, 2 and .NET 4. So 
both binaries optimized for the right environment because we have to, power, to support PowerShell 2, we need to keep on shipping a .NET uh, 2 or .NET 3.5 framework, really, compatible binary. And to fully support 4, we wanted to ship also a, a native .NET 4 uh, compiled binary. So in order to do that, two directories, two different module paths. And actually, one, uh, one interesting thing about that, too, is that PS module path becomes really important when you're in that situation. So if you have customers that have uh, PowerShell 2 today, they may upgrade later to PowerShell 3 or 4. Uh, you're going to want to change, you're going to need to actually change your PS module path so that the first one that it finds of your module is the right one for the version of PowerShell that you're running. So for example, if my PS module path had my PowerShell 3 version first, my PowerShell 2 version after that in the path, and I try to load it into PowerShell version 2, it will actually fail. I was kind of hoping it would keep on looking through all the different paths until it found one that, that worked. But it turns out that the first one that it finds with the name that you've requested is the only one that it tries. So if my PowerShell 3 version was found first, it looks at the manifest and says, what version of PowerShell can you run with? Oh, PowerShell 3? On PowerShell 2, I can't load you. And it just stops. It, it might have could have kept looking through the rest of the paths and found the PowerShell 2 version, but it doesn't. So just word to the wise, your customers will need to, to change their PS module paths in order to uh, mitigate that situation. So like your product installer, in my case, needs to detect what version of PowerShell is there instead of the PS module path uh, as effectively as possible at initial setup. If you have questions. As a way of avoiding that, could you have a single new module path with a PSM one file that at import time checks the, the PowerShell version and loads up the appropriate uh, bits of the thing. That's probably, that, that would maybe be a mitigation to have a, the PSM one actually detect the version of everything. But I was trying to be all bought in with PowerShell and use a module uh, manifest file to make this all happen. So right, yeah, well, you're right, that would be a mitigation. Well, probably. Well, like you have a module manifest and your root module is a PSM one file that's only responsibility is making sure you're loading to load the right stuff, right. Nice segue. <laughs> okay, so when to bend this rule is when you're never going to share your module. It's very simple. And you're always going to be PowerShell 2 compatible. And the risk, of course, is versioning issues and things like that and dealing with a mess in the field. So a suggestion is to organize your scripts so that your PSD one is just your metadata. Your PSM one is nothing but a loader. Oh. Oh. And your functionality is defined in script files that are inside of your module. And, and as the, what is your name, sir? Dave. As Dave suggested, um, the PSM1 file for me could have just decided which DLL to load depending on what version of PowerShell that it was running at the, at the, at the current time. Um, so do you need those to be in PS1 files? They could be other PSM files, could they? Yeah, they could be any, any valid script file, right? Yeah, it could be different sub-modules, that sort of thing, yeah. too. Absolutely, yeah. Right, functionality defined in PS star one files uh, could be anything. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> uh, so you organize them to subfolders as you want. Put your public interface in one folder, internals in another, unit tests, that sort of thing in another folder. Just, you know, how crazy you want to go with it is, 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 is up to you. So it's something to experiment with, see how it feels. Look at how other people, like if you went to the GitHub uh, presentation to start loading other people's modules on GitHub and any other code sharing site and just see what see what works well as far as organization goes. But at least consider it. Yeah, question in the back. Besides the potential of just having a huge ugly PSM1, what are the disadvantages of not using separate PS1s and like say just dropping your 10 functions into the main PSM1? The disadvantages of splitting into multiple files? Well, no, what are what are the disadvantages of not splitting? Simplicity. Just what you said, basically, that uh, it just can get unwieldy and, and crazy huge. Um, nothing else that you know of. Nothing, nothing else, really. So it really is a matter of taste. You know, I think some people very strongly would rather just have one file in that directory versus a bunch of sub-files. Sub but for me, um, as I've developed modules just for my own use um, at work, uh, I got to the point where my PS1 file was just too big. And I just decided, screw it, I'm going to split into separate one function per file and see how that fits for a while. Well, here's, here's one reason is uh, if you've got one giant file and you're using version control, and it's going to be hard to find which change affected a particular piece of functionality. Right, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, so as, uh, 
Yeah, it's isolating your changes as you're checking into version control and that sort of thing. Yeah, instead of looking at 10 changes over 10,000 lines of code, one changes at the top, one's in the middle, and four of them at the bottom, you have them very isolated into separate files. So this is an example of what that loader script might look like. It's, this is nothing, the, the whole content of your PSM1 may be nothing more than get my root path, load every PS1 or PS star 1 file in my path to import them. Now commandlets, they are the UI of your module. And the, op the object types that they output are also part of your UI, but the, the rudimentary thing is your commandlets, because that's how you get your objects. You don't want to have any object until you call it get commandlet, usually. Um, but be careful what you expose. Everything that you put out to the world will be used, if you're lucky or unlucky, depending on how you look at it. Um, so you just have to be very cognizant of what your public interface is versus what your internal nasty guts are. Um, so be wary, be careful, but you know, obviously, if you're building a module, you want to make it useful for people, so uh, put the stuff out there. And the goal, though, is the whole point of this talk is to make your module feel like an extension of PowerShell, not an ugly appendage, right? So then we get into the two problems of computer science. Naming things, cache invalidation, and off by one error. <laughs> <laughs> PowerShell guidelines help with half of these. Right? So the rule is to use standard verbs. There is no bending on this one, uh, not really. So the, but the feel of your module is really in the names. And using the verb dash noun for all of your public commandlets, absolutely mandatory. Don't go away from that. Um, and use standard verbs unless you have a very, very, very good reason to do so. Um, because PowerShell, they say here, it just becomes shell if everybody has to look at the help to understand what the hell's going on. Um, but you can email that guy right there. Is that the correct email address, Jeff? Yes. It is Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, email Jeff if you, if you want to do something outside the box. Thanks for not including the home phone number. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen all the slides yet. <laughs> and the URL here gives the, uh, the web page the list of what all the standard verbs are and what they mean. Or you and can just say get verb. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. I get verb would work as well. <laughs> yeah, in the previous session we actually showed what that function looks like. Uh, look at that. Um, but, uh, but also, they aren't just the standard verbs, they're also the aliases, sort of, or the, the other similar verbs that they, they, can, that they work for, basically. So it's a great resource. If you have, if you have a verb name in mind, go there and see if it uh, maps to one of the standard verbs, if it isn't one already. Now, the big deal here, too, is your noun names. The rule is to prefix your noun names with a common prefix. So you have to pick the one that's, gonna that's least likely to change, right? Your product name, your company name, or some other, whatever control project name, right? <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's funny, but like in my example, uh, working in the back of the exec team for a very long time, um, our product name has stayed the same forever, uh, since before I even got to the company. And uh, whereas our, our sister product, NetBackup, used to be called Backup Plus, and their command lines all start with BP. And that didn't make any sense to me until I asked somebody, why, why BP, why not NB, or something like that. Oh yeah, we used to be called Backup Plus. But they were already entrenched at that point, so their command names stuck, because all those production scripts were using them, right? So just try to guess which is least likely to change your company name, or your product name, or some other name. You know, right. So for me, I had to do a get BP job, not get job, which would be very natural if I'm just thinking about me. But I have to think about the ecosystem that I'm plugging into. And when it comes to the ecosystem, when it comes to the ecosystem, <laughs> did you just shut Jeff Snowden? Who did that? <laughs> Boy, you guys got ball. Anyway, <laughs> so PS is reserved for PowerShell, of course, and is reserved for Windows OS. So no, no prefix. I, I just give that one to Windows. Um, so they, they have get job for Windows. Uh, well, actually, those are PowerShell jobs, aren't they? We, uh, when we provide a framework for other people to plug into, we grab the generic name. So jobs, you can have 
HDMI jobs, you can have schedule jobs. We can tell you how to plug your jobs into our framework and have common commandlets. So then we grab the name. Okay, yeah, great. So let's catch it on the, uh, on the microphone here. When, when Microsoft provides a framework for something like jobs, there are many different types of jobs. They'll just use the job uh, noun and let uh, other vendors or you know internal folks at Microsoft plug into that. So they'll wrap WMI jobs, schedule jobs, other types of jobs under the job now. But if it doesn't have a prefix, it belongs to Microsoft. Or if it has a PS prefix, that's also Microsoft's. Yeah, question. What if that was a community thing some you know, something Yeah, if it's a community thing, I'd say the project name, some prefix uh, that, that kind of is an abbreviation of the project name right. it would be appropriate. Is it better to actually hard code the name with your prefix or to use the dash prefix on the uh, import module? That's a good question. Uh, use the prefix on import module or hard code it. I would hard code it myself, uh, but I'm a developer, so. Okay, so if you want to stay V2 compatible, then don't do the prefix. I guess yeah, the, the, the issue answer. is that, that that allows the customer to deal with the naming conflict. So in general, the, the mindset was use these prefixes to avoid the customer ever having a name conflict or minimize the chances. But then if there is one, then the minus prefix allows the customer to get around it. But as the customer, I might say minus prefix A and you might say minus B and you might say minus C. So then there's no community scripts out there that are going to work. That's why it's a, lab, it's a it's a fixing a broke situation mechanism. So, right. when, so when I load ex the Exchange module and the Office 365 module, I use the prefix so I can keep the Git mailboxes separate. Yeah. Right. So it's a backdoor for end users. As a, as a module developer, then you do want to code your own prefix. Type before I get involved, and I'm lazy and I don't like to do a lot of work. 
So as a developer, I want PowerShell to give me a fully formed object. I don't want to get a string and have to go figure out what you meant by that string. Um, and it just gives a lot of intelligence power. It gives all kinds of things to the, to the environment uh, to help you out. There are a number of benefits for doing that. Uh, one is if you, if you strongly type something and say, for example, it's a file, and something passes a string, what PowerShell will do is it will do is it cast that string to a file. And when it casts it, what it actually does is it create it, it get back a file object, which is a non-existent read-only file in the system directory. Okay. Quite often, you're much safer as far as user input is concerned, not overdoing the, the, the type system on the parameters that you pass and sorting out inside the function what you pass. So when to beg it when it doesn't work right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, there, there are cases uh, where That's one particular down. weird case, but in general, you're yeah. going to produce your own types. Yeah. And when you're producing your own types, it's better if your parameters are strongly typed. And the critical element of that is that they have a null constructor. If you have a null constructor, that allows us to let the user type in a hash table, and then we have a converter from hash tables to objects if the object has a null constructor. And this is also critical for remoting. If you do implicit remoting, um, then the question is, well, how do I give a strong object, a strong type across a remoting boundary? In general, that's not possible. And the answer is yes. That's why if you have a null constructor, uh, we will take a hash table, send a hash table across the wire, and then we can convert the hash table to your strong type. So everything works out nicely that way. You know, I have a question for you in just a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> one of the next slides. Can I that's just that's jump into one other one on, on this, this thing? Of, uh, By the way, this is James O'Neill. Uh, <laughs> pro tip. <laughs> 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 I went to a session yesterday, and like this guy's been on the intelligence road in ways that I haven't yet. So Yeah, for those people who do know me, it's James Bloody O'Neill. <laughs> 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 the, uh, the, the other problem that you get is if you look at the stuff you were doing in your previous session, where you were taking a things like a, a, a VE storage object. If you say if, it's, if that has a name and you say and the user has to pass a storage object to another function, <coughs> you want the user to be able to, part to either give the name of the storage object or to be able to get the object. Right. Right? If you actually write your code so that the user has to call your call a function with brackets, get storage object to name of object, you're making the thing too cumbersome in my view. And that's something that I've, I've long argued against. Mm -hmm. uh, now, so you have to, the, sometimes where, where you, you actually see people who say, no, it must be one of those, you end up having to, having to put an extra function in just to satisfy the, the, the criteria. Instead of saying, we'll, we'll allow the parameter to come in, and then we'll deal with that name as a string and go and fetch whatever kind of object it should be. Another way to get around is to say a parameter that that one takes the string version and one takes the other version. Exactly. That, that way you know exactly what you're getting by the parameter set. It's still on PowerShell to decide what the plugin is based on the types. Yep. And if, if your type has a uh, constructor that takes a single string parameter, I think PowerShell will just use that if you pass it a string. You can find yourself in some weird situations when you are when you have these multiple parameter sets and one of them is string because almost any type can be converted to string. Yeah. So you're sort of providing a workaround around the strongly typedness. It's just going to take this other random thing, make it a string, and then give it to your function. And that could do weird stuff. I'm, I'm almost there. We're <laughs> <gonna guess. laughs> oh yeah, this, this is great. Right the room too. This, this is. This is <laughs> <laughs> I know Jeff Snover's right there, but I mean, come on. My session. <laughs> Thank you. For coming. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, so, uh, so again, uh, James, Bloody O'Neill, uh, you put the, the bend in here for me um, yesterday. I believe it was you. Um, yeah, that's a really great insight. Again, learning so much from being here. This is just awesome to be in a room full of geniuses with PowerShell. It's just great. Um, 
So there are attributes you can put on your parameters to do validation and things like that automatically, say whether they bind to the pipeline, or whether they're mandatory or not, whether they're positional. Use as few as possible, definitely use them, but uh, don't go crazy. And definitely try the validation uh, attributes with and without them and see what the output looks like and consider a user that isn't you, that doesn't know your app very well and may not know PowerShell really, really well yet either and doesn't know what a regex is at all. Right, and just to imagine their world when they get the error messages that PowerShell may give them back, because PowerShell does all of the attribute stuff before you get involved. You're not involved until all the parameters are bound, and your begin block is being called. And by the time that's happening, your parameters are already set. Um, but if PowerShell can't figure out from the syntax that the user is giving which parameter set it matches, error to the <coughs> user before you're involved. Um, you know, if it's a regex sort of a thing and it's a string, it doesn't match the regex, PowerShell says, hey, it doesn't match this regex. So uh, sometimes you need to give a kinder, gentler error message to your user and do a little bit more work in, in your, uh, inside the code of your command line in order to give that best possible user experience. And also, you want to minimize the number of parameter sets that you've got, but that's, it's not the worst thing in the world to have a bunch of them. There are certain scenarios that need them. A lot of the new and add commandlets where you're adding new objects to your system uh, require a lot of flexibility. So that's where a lot of your parameters come into. Like new BE schedule for me has a large count. I think it's around 20 parameter sets because there's just so many ways to specify a schedule. Um, but by and large, it's just a couple on, on any given set. But when you're piping strongly typed objects through the pipeline, all of the strong types that your commandlet can receive probably need their own parameter set so that PowerShell can do the right matching. Uh, so that's another case where your parameter sets grow, but you don't necessarily have more parameters because of it, or not too many more. So IT pros in the audience, do parameter sets give you a headache? Raise your hand if, if like a commandlet that, when you look at help, it scrolls off the screen because of all the different built-in syntaxes, because that, that piss you off? Where are you? Like what that? It's, it's like where object. Like where object? <laughs> the, worst, the worst ones I find is ones that have a lot of parameters set and there's a ton of parameters in each one. So you have to uh, hustle around for hours to right. figure out what the different sets are. Yeah, lots of parameters and sets, and all the sets have lots of parameters. Yeah, you have to spend a day just to figure out how to make one call. Yeah, that's no good. Hey, can I, can I yeah. yeah, sure, yeah. So this has been like a multi year argument. At some point, you know, the argument was, well, Exchange, you know, it's got 100 parameters to add a user. That should be 10 commands with one, with, you know, 10 parameters each. And I don't know, it's like, geez, is it better to have 10 parameters, 10 commands with 10 parameters that you have to put together, or one command with 100 parameters? I mean, at some point, you've got to type them, you've got to type them. And this debate went on and off. But within the team, we had various uh, arguments, various positions. In the end, we concluded that there was a right answer, and it was the 80-20 rule. That often, when you have a, something with a ton of parameters, they're often edge cases. So what you do is you take the things that most people are going to want, the 20% of the case, and that's in the main command. And then the other one, you have like new P PS session options. That's how you do it. Now, the newest PS session options has all the details, all the timeouts and this, and check revocation certificates, blah, blah, blah. Most things that nobody in the world cares about, but some people really care about. And then the main UPS session, you get the things that most people want. So that pattern of 80-20 seems to be the right answer after many, many, many years of vigorous debate. Great, yeah, okay, so when you have a lot of complicated esoteric options, make a new object for them. So you can create those and attach just one object to a, a simpler object. Uh, with all those extra complicated parameters that users can opt in with if they need there. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, another rule is enable pipeline binding because the pipeline is the best thing about PowerShell ever. Uh, you want to be able to pipe things through the pipeline, you get a nice flow going, make it feel like you're actually using PowerShell, right? That's the whole point, you're making a PowerShell module. You're not making a glorified VB script module. Um, so a couple of patterns. Uh, the identity pattern uh, is one that, that we've just adopted. If you get an object, you always just have a dead object sitting in memory, right? So 
sometimes they get updated at the back end. So just being able to pipe an object back at the get commandlet through the pipeline, just a nice way to like get a refresh version of this so I can look at it again. So like across the board, we just have that pattern built in. And, um, and the pipeline is great for filtering. So if you have a master object and you want to get the things that are related to it, just happily popping down the pipelines. Uh, that's, that's the kind of flow that you want to be able to give your users. And uh, yeah, the, the strong object type is, is the, the key to all of that. Now, this one I'm going to actually ask the audience for once for some input on this. Value from pipeline. <laughs> I, I use the Hyper-V command list, and the DM name is, is bound by a property name, I'm pretty sure, because that's how I use it all the time. Um, so it seems to me that the pattern here is you've got a module where all the objects pretty much have a property like VM name, you know, because all the stuff in Hyper-V, it's all dealing with VMs. It might be the network cards, the virtual disks, all kinds of things that are attached to a particular VM. So all of those objects have their key. You know, the thing I belong to is the VM name. So I can pipe any of those objects at any of the commandlets, and like I could, I, I don't know technically if this is true, but I could probably maybe take a, a network adapter that's attached to a, a Hyper-V VM, pipe that object at an add virtual disk commandlet, and it's gonna pull the VM name property off of my you know, virtual network card object and attach a, a new disk to the right VM. I, I don't really know the, the key scenario for pipeline by property name. I think just about everything that we do finds by the, just the value of the pipeline. Jeff, do you have any uh, like key scenarios? Or is, is anybody I who's developing one? Because I think the one that's a now ship copied that behavior from what I did when I implemented the first version of it. And it basically was, uh, it was always going to be the thing that uh, identified the virtual ship yeah. uh, would we'll, we'll always be a VM name. So if you said, I want to go out of disk disk controller, then you, you, knew what the, you knew what the what the virtual machine was when you, when you gave the disk controller by getting the VM name. And indeed, it had exactly the side effect that you described. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happened now, despite the passage of time and people going and kind of wondering whether that's a good idea, I think that's still in the shipping Where one of the places where it's really useful it is if you specify a full name, the path on loads and loads of objects is always full name. So anything that you find where you put a file, mm -hmm. if you if you conjure some other object up and you give it a full name and you pass it into copy or delete or move, those, those commands will process properly if you if because they will look for pipeline by property name of the, the full name property. Yes. So um, sometimes it's, it, it's more useful to look at this from the point of view of creating the object rather than from the point of view of the, the, um, the function. But when you do something that accepts files, instead of you can always say, if, I, if I've got a, a full name property, I can treat that as a path, and I know it's always going to work, because that's what everything else seems to do. I'm so glad that you're in both the sessions, especially when you just reminded me of actually when I've used value pipeline line. Uh, name. I have an edit function that actually has the alias to open file in ISE, and you can pipe a command at it, or a file, or a module. If you pipe a module, it actually loads everything for the module and just loads all the files in the ISE. If you pipe a command, which is really useful because if the command is a script, it'll you can get its full path, but that property name is different than the property name I'm looking for on a module versus a the full path or the full name on a file info that's coming in. So I bind, uh, I bind my property name. I just, I just look for the right property names, and depending on which one that I got, that's how I process internally to know what to load. Uh, so for writing functions, it's super useful. You can always have an alias. Yeah. Right, exactly, and I think I, I did that here and there. So the same, same deal. Hey, Jim? <coughs> but I've heard this idea, so hopefully, but I'm appropriately. But um, the other thing about value from pipeline by property name is that you can put that in multiple But versus yeah. splatting, because splatting kind of solves all of that, too. That, 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 that doesn't come from the pipeline. Oh, right. Yeah, so the big issue here is, is it's actually a long conversation. The heart of it is is versus has. If you, some, if you bind by is, 
there are very few things that produce the thing that is something. So the number of things you can plug in together is small. If you has has, it opens up to a wide range of things that can then plug things together. So you can get some misappropriate plugs, but in general, the power is worth the risk. The easiest thing to get in focus is, you know, uh, import CSV. You know, so at some point, whatever you generate, you can export it to CL, XML, or to CSV or JSON, and then you can import those things. Now you've lost the type; it's no longer the type, but it has all the properties. So if you bind by property name, you can get those things and use those like, those things to then find the object and act upon it. So it may actually even be if you're, the purpose of your module is to plug in with a larger ecosystem outside of itself, as opposed to being the wrapper for your world, then binding by property name gives you that ability to bind with other things in the world more easily, as opposed to just your types. Just, just one other note, if you're gonna use in different parameter sets, both value from pipeline and value from pipeline by property name, uh, default parameter set name is your friend, otherwise you can. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should've put that as a rule, always specify the default yeah. parameter set name, because you will eventually have to. And it's also very important there, then to have your input be value from pipeline property be strongly tied so that it can tell exactly when to feed that thing down. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important. As John, that combination back to what John said is if you have pipeline by value and the type of the thing you're binding is string, absolutely everything in the world will pipe to you. And that's almost <laughs> gen certainly a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> support wildcards because you're in a shell. You want to get that shell feel, you want to get mouth feel or something like that. So again, don't be an ugly appendage. So support wildcards. Um, otherwise, yeah, your customers will have to remember exact names for everything. And I don't have any pending here because you really, really should. And it's not that hard because there's a nice class uh, that you can use uh, internally to do wildcard matching. You have no host. You're alone in the world. You're, you're in a cold, dark place where you have no way to talk to the world except for through the, the streams. The output, warning, error, verbose streams. Uh, the only time that you really bend this is when the whole purpose of your module is to extend a specific host or to plug in with a specific host. But in general, your modules are probably exposing some functionality that, that really doesn't need a specific host. So if you have host specific Parts, just put them in one little corner, make them very <coughs> don't don't bake it into everywhere. Never use right host. If that everybody's been had that drawn in their head uh, over and over again. Don Jones' favorite sentence. Finally, some demos. Alright. Alright. So let's get my favorite module word up here. So let's just take a look and see all of the gets that I've got. Get commands from our module, verb get, tons of them. And now let's see which ones don't start with B. No. So follow the rule. Okay. Now if we get help on a specific uh, command lid, to make sure that I actually have real help instead of just the auto-generated stuff. And I do. A little blur, related links. There's all kinds of great stuff in the help. You can uh, give examples. And I would do that if I wasn't running uh, a demo script right now, but uh, get help dash examples is just the, the icing on the cake. I mean, that's once you learn that, and people that are new to PowerShell want to show them that, that's their go-to command. Um, so they can learn right away how to use the command line. And just the, the way that the help's been formatted, so there are uh, all these similar, the same sections for everybody's help, just makes it super easy and, uh, and awesome. And we had, went ahead and added a show me help that brings up the Windows help thing. Again, for people who are newer to PowerShell, for some reason, some people, believe it or not, still like bringing up the GUI to read through the help at their leisure without actually being in the command line that I never do. But we just generate that from the same sources, so it's no extra work, really. It's just a script that does the multiple outputs. Now I was talking about parameter sets. 
Ruby schedule. It's got a few of them. Mm -hmm. That's a fun thing. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. <coughs> I didn't mention this in any of the slides, but enumerations are your friend. They are the best thing ever when you're writing a module. The PowerShell 3, I think, is where the completion started coming in uh, at both the, the, the console and the ISC host. And uh, keeps everybody inside the lines in a very nice, easy to use way. So just a couple examples of the different parameter sets. So a daily schedule starting 11 p.m. Schedule every two days. So it's similar, just added one more parameter to it. Weekly every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 10 p.m. And you can see the output here. This is, a, this is a place where the rules are bent a bit. It turns out that sometimes your output is really, really hard, especially when you're localizing it uh, to Asian languages and all the uh, European languages and everything like that. It's very hard to get this sort of output and using format uh, PS1 XML files. So what I, the, the actual formatter for a scheduler is just getting a single string property of the scheduled object. So the scheduled object themselves have all the scheduled goodies in them, but they also have one kind of slightly off-putting property that is the, this is the string to show when you're dumping it out to the screen. That's the only reason that it exists. And it turns out it's very similar to what our GUI would actually show as well. But, uh, Let me do that one second. Sure. So here's my, here's my favorite parameter set that we've <laughs> added here. Monthly every qualified day. So we've got second Wednesday, fourth Sunday, first Friday, third Friday, last Friday starting at 11.59 p.m. What should that look like? Oh, oh nice. nice. Huh? That's just a string. That's my favorite thing in the whole product. <laughs> 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 looks just like the GUI, but it's better. Uh, um, okay, now I'm going to go ahead and make a backup definition. Again. Just backing up my PS Summit stuff so that if the demo fails, I've got a backup of it. Now notice, hate this uh, agent server demo. Agent server is the thing that you're, uh, that you're backing up. It's a server that has the agent on it, so that was our name that we came, came up with. Both of those names were kind of overloaded, but uh, BE agent server turned out to be the, the winner of that now contest. But I didn't even quote that. Um, it's not an object. Let's take a look at that parameter real quick. So the agent server parameter is required. Uh, it's not positional, it's a main parameter. And they can accept pipeline input, that's cool. But its type is a BP agent server. So I gave it an unquoted string, and I didn't get a syntax error. So we'll get in for just a minute uh, how that all works, uh, addressing the whole problem of you should not make you do a get BE agent server with the name. I just put the name in there, and it still works. Now I'm going to go ahead and set a property. So I took the object that I created, I it to the setter, so all of my properties have parameters on my setter. And because this is a complicated object, I can embellish it, I can add more tasks to it, I can do all kinds of things. I like to pull it into memory, or the pattern is you pull it into memory, you manipulate it with your sets and your adds and your moves and all that sort of business, and then you always have to save it at the end. And, uh, and what, one thing we did too is that if you don't save it at the end of a pipeline, you get a warning. Should have shown that in the demo, but uh, you get a warning that says, "Oh, you've changed this, but you haven't saved it yet." So you know, think about that that sort of use case too. So your users aren't surprised when they call a setter and then the property is actually set on the object that's stored in your in your database. So it worked. I've got the demo backup. Here's my description now, and here's that identity pipeline business I was talking about earlier. I'm taking the object, passing it in again to the getter and it just goes and gets a refreshed version of the object for me. Now, a backup definition defines a backup, but it, that definition creates actual jobs that will run. Oh, quick question, Ben. Uh, I think that, that main parameter, that thing, um, uh, string, that doing the right thing. Yeah. I think that's equal to an AD and the change to what they call the identity parameter. Is there like guidance for one design book that do with identity parameter? Do you want to do the same way? Do you actually call it? Or is it good to call it? 
What I did um, is we have a name and an ID uh, parameter. They're in different parameter sets because you can only do one or the other, either the string name or the good, that is the ID of the object, both the properties of all the objects. Uh, but we just call the properties name and ID, and there's always a parameter set. Those two parameter sets on, on every getter. Yeah. Okay. And setter. In your help then, do you reference, say, in this, in this parameter name, I accept these things, like a DD using the name or the, the search path, or do you have to specify the help then? Oh, I'm sorry, actually. Yeah, that, that what I was talking about was the uh, the getters, and actually just the getters. The getters have the name and the ID. The setters take the strongly typed object. Yeah. So, um, but if you say the parameter name on the setter though is like dash agent server, okay. not dash identity or dash name or anything like that. It's dash agent server, and if you gave it a string, yeah. or even a string that happened to be a good. It's going to try to load it by name first, but if that fails, it'll actually try to convert that string into a good. If it works, it'll then go try to do it by ID automatically. So that's just the way that we coded it internally to, to try really hard to take whatever string you gave and convert it to the right object type. Yeah. Right? Um, but the name of the parameter is the, the unprefixed uh, type, type name, so agent server in this case. Okay, so that, that whole pipeline business of getting related objects by uh, passing through the pipeline, so it spit out a bunch of jobs, they kick them off. Confirm there, so yes, all of them. So now, that, that whole ID business, I just pulled out the, the ID of my backup definition, and I'm going to try to get it using that ID object. So it's just giving a goo at this time. I want to see which of my jobs are active. So I do have a good job. Yay. Demo gods are with me. I'm just daring them now. Um, so you had another way to do it. So we see up here. Okay. So I've done a lot of gets, right? Um, up above, I just pipe the object to the getter again, and got the object back. This time, I called the get with the ID, and it still worked, and I got all the jobs off of it. But what's actually happening is get the e job has a dash backup definition parameter. That's the magic, right? So this guy binds from pipeline by value, and that's what's actually getting the backup definition that's fetched using its ID. This finishes getting it, that object is patched to the pipeline, and it is bound to backup definition. But another way to do that is just give the name of the backup definition, and inside the module, I look at that string and convert it into a backup definition object that go fetch it for you, since you didn't do it for me up here. This, that's just another way to slice it. So get the jobs from that backup definition, the ones that are active, and wait for them for five seconds. Oh, I guess it's already finished. Your demo because it was supposed to fail. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to get nothing here. Yeah, shoot. Let me start off the job again. seconds for the jobs that are running to quit, and a time up occurred, so I didn't, uh, wasn't able to get that, so let me capture the jobs, and now see the status active. Let me try to set the status. Can't do it. It's a read-only property. So this is another one of the rules. Oh, I'm really over time. I'm sorry, guys. Um, go back to the slides real fast. Be two minutes. Fly through the rest. Uh, so many questions during the whole session. So just everything is a public API. It'll be used. It's very hard to take things away once they've got out in the wild. Uh, there are some namespaces that 
the commands and objects are the last part of your namespace. That's actually a rule that Microsoft laid out. Uh, generally avoid the aliases. Pascal case the world, so it starts with a capital, not a lower, and all the words are capitalized in between. And create read-only object types. That's the last part of the demo is actually showing. Uh, that way they're very much like property bags, but you control the setters through your set commandlets. That's maybe another controversial point that we can't go into a deep dive in, but for me, it's read-only objects only. You never get an object that you play with. You don't call methods on it, nothing. Command, commandlets are your only interface with doing things to your objects. And then that whole magic of taking a string, implementing parse, converting from deserialized uh, things, use a deserializing type converter. So reading the help on that, that's how all that magic actually happens. PowerShell has these hooks into your module to do all of that work for you. The biggest rule of them all, if you're doing binary modules, FX top when your project is born, and add the PowerShell FX top rules. They actually gave DLLs for that. It's awesome. And a lot of the rules that we just went through are encoded in those FX top rules. So I didn't just make this stuff up. Uh, and you can even write your own as, as needed. You can, it's not too hard to write an FX top rule. We did one just to make sure that BE was our prefix on our noun, so I can't get out, uh, uh, you know, get out that. And always provide help for every parameter, every commandlet, no excuses. And ultimately, use your module so you get the feel of it. Because there's, there's still kind of a, a subjective kind of a, a feeling that you get off a well-designed commandlet, well-designed module. And if you don't like using your own stuff, no one else is going to either, right? So thank you so much. Uh, thank you.